Welcome to the Art of Semi-Fiction. I'm Jane Daly. And I'm Robin Miller. And today's episode, we're going to be diving into the subject of how can you have a true dialogue in memoir and nonfiction? <laughs> you sounded like a reporter on that one. That was, that was Jane Daly reporting the news at six. That was awesome. Yes. So, let me ask you a question, Robin. Uh-oh. That's why you had, that's why you're in professional mode. Oh, yes. Okay. Is it possible to have true dialogue in nonfiction? Obviously, there's some yes to that. In the example of, um, you know, a lot of memoirs, we talk a lot about Susie Flory, um, who's written 14 books, a lot of them collaborative memoirs. Um, you know, she records things, and, mm -hmm. and um, we've talked, Lynn Vincent, um, who, who does the same thing, she has hours and hours of, of dialogue that she's, you know, that she's got access to. So you can have verbatim dialogue mm -hmm. in nonfiction, and if you have access to it, that's a great idea, because it's dodgy ground when you're slipping off the, I have documented evidence that this is exactly what some people said, either through a written something or other or taped, and you're having to remember it because then you're in that kind of dodgy ground. Well, and, and there's been huge evidence of what they call shared memories. There, yes. There's a memory that, that I have of something that happened to Mike and me when we were in Spain. And when he tells the story, he's the one who made the discovery, even uh, though in my memory, I'm the one who made the discovery. Uh -huh. So who's right? See, because well, we, you obviously no. <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> Mike's taller than you. Mike's right. Okay, Mike's Mike, right. Mike, I just let Mike. I just let Mike have the story. Mike being her husband, not just somebody she travels to Spain with. But um, I want to read a quote that I read in an earlier podcast. This is by our friend and author Jan Kern. Yes. Because I think we need to really remember this. Okay. Narrative nonfiction should be written so the storytelling is so compelling it reads like well written fiction. Love that. And we know in well-written fiction, dialogue moves the story forward. Yep. So how we have what we call true dialogue, or how do we have dialogue in nonfiction? Um, because we're, we're basically recounting an event, as we've yeah. discussed, and there's an inciting incident. Yeah. And rather than say, and then this happened, and then this happened, yeah. and then this happened, and I, it turned out fine, we have to have some some storytelling techniques yep. and dialogue is a part of that. It, if otherwise you're going to end up with kind of a how-to. Yeah. And, and we've talked in previous episodes about avoiding that. That's old school. Yeah. Old school would be a nonfiction, would be a how-to, get out of debt in four easy steps. Yeah, And there's exactly. still a place for that. I mean, I, I was just hearing Dave Ramsey whisper in my ear saying, but that's what I do, and that's fine. There are certain types of books, but what yeah. we're talking about is narrative nonfiction and memoir, which is a different genre than a how-to, yeah. how to you know, get out of debt or how to build a pool or yeah. you know, how to rewire your house. Um, There's YouTube for that. I was just going <laughs> to say, although I wouldn't read a book about it, I would probably go to YouTube. YouTube. Well, so, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that, that that's um, a good point in the use of, of fiction techniques in nonfiction. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, when we talked about the, that book I was talking about earlier um, in an earlier podcast, The Year of Less mm -hmm. by Kate Flanders, she's writing about a process of learning how to live with less things and not be in consumer debt and all the things that she learned that year um, that she took off from, from spending anything but on, on mm -hmm. anything except for what she needed, consumables and gas and whatever. Um, that was, in a sense, it could have been a how-to, mm -hmm. right? That could have been one in, you know, 20 years ago, probably would have been written as a how-to with very little narrative in it. It would have been more, you know, maybe a little bit of sidebar, you know, anecdote, or maybe a quick little anecdote, but that really would have been a little bit more formulaic. But instead, she wrote it narratively, mm -hmm. right? And fiction, and one of the things, I, I'm going to read the last line of that because, um, because I think that it's really important to what we're talking about today. The year of less, this is actually half of the sentence, um, the last sentence of, their, of the blurb. The year of less will leave you questioning what you're holding on to in your own life. And what I want to draw out of that is it will leave you questioning. Mm -hmm. So instead of you getting the answers 
getting the formula or the key, it will it partners with you in thinking about the, the subject and what parts apply to you and whether or not there's a lesson there for you in your own life. That's a different kind of how-to book mm -hmm. than used to be written. And part of how we don't get told what to do is we get to observe and make our own our own observations. So that old thing that we hear about at all writing conferences, show, don't tell. Oh my goodness. Is that I, on your notes? That was my next, I was waiting for you to stop talking so I could say, and. Got there first, <laughs> got there first. But, but you know, that's, that's, the, that's part of the showing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Where you don't have to say, my mom was a snarky person. Not that my mom was a snarky person, I'm just saying. But, you know, if, she, but if she was, my mom. <laughs> if she was, you know, you don't say it, you would show it in a, in a dialogue mm -hmm. snippet that shows how somebody speaks. And then the reader draws their own conclusion. Mm -hmm. So you're not spoon feeding them, you're saying, this is the situation. You make your own observations. Right. You bring yourself to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We know that it's a huge no-no to tell in fiction versus show. So dialogue in nonfiction is a way for us to show and not tell, just like yeah. what you said. You know, in, in some of the things I've written, people may think that my mom was a snarky person, and she kind of was. And I show that by the, some of the comments that she made and some of the ways that she loved to push buttons through our conversation. Yeah. You know, I have an instance where I start a chapter and my mom says, does June 1st mean anything to you? And I, I said, <laughs> um, I'm racking my, in, my, in my mind, I'm racking my brain. And, I'm, I'm, and then I said, no, should it? And my mom says, well, Yes, it's the day that I can start to, I, I can request to have my widow's veterans benefits mm. um, increased. Kind of like, you should have known this. Yes. And I'm thinking, that would have been the last thing I'd like. <laughs> did somebody die on June 1st? Is it somebody's is, birthday? Is it somebody's, <laughs> what did I forget? And so yeah. I go through, the, through the, the, the conversation with my mom of her saying, here, here's all the forms. We need to fill them out. And what she's saying is, is, you need to fill them out. And yeah. so that conversation is, is, is showing, it's showing um, how stressful it was yeah. to deal with my mom's stuff. Well, and, and if you think about how would you have come across if you very rightly, at a, at a portion of your mom's life, she was, you know, as, as some people who were getting older, and your mom lived a long time. <laughs> she did. 90s, right? Was it uh, 90? 94? 94. That's, you know. That's a good one. She could be crotchety. I think she'd earned the right, you know, somewhere around 85 to be crotchety. Yeah. But, but if you had said as a daughter, my mom is getting a little, you know, hard, sharp tongue. Hard to deal with. Yeah. Then you would have looked like a cat, right? <laughs> right. We'd have been like, well, I don't want to read anything you've got to say because you're mean to your mom, right? But if we just step back and say, uh, you judge for yourself. <laughs> you know, yeah. here's, what, here's what my mom said. What do you think? Then it, it, it also takes the the pressure off of you looking like you're telling tales or you know or you're being, being mean. I'm the bad daughter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because the truth is, you know, some people are crotchety, right? So they, so showing that mm -hmm. is a an incredibly powerful way. In a very short amount of time, you can get somebody's personality, somebody's motives, somebody's tone in there and you don't have to say a word you don't have to then summarize and say see i told you audience mm -hmm. she's a little bit grumpy nowadays right? yeah. she hit 90 and things got a little bit sketchy you know you, you you're uh, you're absolved of any responsibility all you're doing is reporting the facts so that's, that's a wonderful thing to think of when you're writing something negative the more you can show and let the the um the audience come to their own conclusion right? And the best way to do it is how people speak. How people speak. We all speak. have opinions, and, yeah. And there's, I mean, there's, I'm sure that we don't remember every single word of every single conversation. Mm. But the truth is, the true dialogue in nonfiction and memoir is remembering as best we can. Yeah. And putting it in a way that is not going to be harmful to that other person. Because my intent was not to make my mom look bad. My mom, it was just that day was very important to her. Yeah. And and yeah. maybe it didn't maybe the conversation didn't go exactly like that, but I wanted to make the point that it meant a big deal to her. Yeah. To me it meant nothing except yeah. 
then finding out it's gonna be so much work. Yeah. <laughs> I have so much paperwork to do. Exactly. So I wanted to read a passage from one of my favorite books that I've talked about before, and I forgot to do the disclaimer that this is not a Christian book, not mm -hmm. written by a Christian author, has some language. So if you're easily offended, you're not gonna wanna read this, but this is how uh, Starbucks I saved my life. Which, and, and this is not your, what the bit you're going to read is not. We don't have to like plug any. I'm going to just bleep. I'm going to bleep. I'm going to bleep the area. We're going to bleep. Need okay. To be bleeped. You bleep. I'm um, taking a drink. So, no, this is not the bleeping part. That was okay. later in the book. Okay. Um, so, we're, the the main the the author Michael um, has interviewed with Crystal. So, author Michael, a uh, fifty-ish white man, who had been an advertising executive who's right. lost his job, interviewing with a 20-something black uh, Starbucks manager, okay. okay? So setting the scene, um, so he's talking about it, and he says, it didn't, it didn't seem to matter. Crystal didn't really seem to be listening. You know how you can be talking to someone on the phone and sense they're pretending to listen to you while doing something they feel is more important? I felt that way that day with Crystal. For me, this phone call was of crucial importance to her, it was just another chore in a hectic day. The casual way in which she offered me the job was humiliating. Okay, she said, show up at my store on 93rd and Broadway at 3.30 p.m. tomorrow. 93rd and Broadway, I echoed, surprised by the address. Yes, she sounded like she was instructing a three-year-old. 93rd and Broadway, and don't be late. I was confused, but we met at 78th and Lex. So, she was almost threatening. I met you there because we had a hiring open house going on. That's the way we do things at Starbucks. Okay. So, now that, that conversation may or may not have gone exactly that way, but he's using it to make a point. Yeah. He goes on to say, I know that tone. I used that tone. Yeah. I was that tone. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and I think going back to what something you said earlier, that's, it, it's, it, it's important to remember that we are subjective creatures. So even if I say, I swear up and down one side and up the other that somebody said this exact phrase, somebody might on a stack of Bibles swear the exact opposite that that was right. not was said. Yeah. And of course, how much... It, which, which we can't put as easily into a book, but how much do we get about that conversation? So if, if, if in that conversation, the manager person was looking at her phone while she's talking to him, or drumming her fingers on the table, mm -hmm. or raising her eye, whatever she was doing, she was giving some signals that he knew there was more to what she was saying than what she was saying, which may have made him tweak what he was saying, what she was said to have said, which he was reported to have said, simply to get across the fullness of a picture we can't get right. from just his, reading the dialogue. His humiliation, yes. um, her really, I just need to get people hired. Could you just show up for work? Yeah. And and that, that play of emotion that, that he had, she didn't have, because she just needed to fill a job. He's exactly. desperate like, for a job, exactly. any job, because his his emotions and, and his his psyche is in tatters because he got fired. Yes, and I think and I think that that's with one of one of the the points. It was interesting because I I went to a Christian college for my undergraduate and for graduate I went to a university that was supposed to be started as a Christian university, where it's at now. No. But, um, so all, we didn't read any Christian literature or fiction or non nothing that some stuff completely not. But we can, one of the, in one of my classes, we were talking about this very issue. And there were some examples given of writers who wrote dialogue, some of which was before they could have remembered. They, if, you're, yeah. if you think, can you remember an exact words of a conversation you had? I mean, a full exchange, not a phrase, not a word, when you were five? No. No, yeah. So they both wrote um, stories in which were kind of memoir, personal narrative, but then they also attached to those stories a discussion about 
where is that threshold of truth? Mm -hmm. What what gives you the okay? And one was, it's got to be as true as you possibly can make it true. Do your best to be as true as possible. Mm -hmm. Be as accurate as possible and let the facts do you know their work. The other one was, you just need to be true to the, the kind of the import of the conversation and how you construct it, even if you're putting words in somebody else's mouth, nah, doesn't make any difference. As long as you get that maybe mom was snarky and something was important to her, or one person was desperate and the other person was indifferent or whatever. She didn't find any kind of compulsion to be factual in those those. So do you think that the there's somewhere in the middle? As or or <clears throat> would you go either way? Well, I I think I think I didn't, and I had to write something, and I, I, I fully went against the one who was fast and loose with the truth. If you're writing nonfiction, and you are saying, my mom said this, that's a pretty serious thing. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's close to what she said, and it's pretty, pretty close, I'm okay with that, because I don't know that you can ever remember exact words. Right. But... If you know your mom didn't say it, but you're mad at your mom because she you know, made you do the paperwork, but really she was just, please, would you mind? And here's some cookies I baked. You know, if she was that and you're like, I'm mad at her. And you know, you're putting stuff in her mouth that didn't happen. Then I have a problem with that. As Christian writers, I think our threshold of integrity is higher than the world's. Mm -hmm. I think there's got to be a standard. Yeah. But that then you've got this ugly dilemma. If you're writing, I don't remember what I did this morning. I, I couldn't verbatim say how I greeted you when I came in today. I, I couldn't say verbatim. I could tell you the gist of it. Mm -hmm. We were both kind of excited to see each other, happy, we we're chatty. We did. I, could, I could create a conversation in which the gist of the emotion would have been true, mm -hmm. but I could not reconstruct two words we put together, let alone what happened so, last year so or 10 how, years ago. How much embellishment is too much embellishment? Because we know that we're going to have to embellish some in our nonfiction to make a point. Yeah. Otherwise, we're looking at a boring treatise, Yeah. And, and we don't want that. So how do we as Christians, and I don't have a right answer, so there will be no quiz, <laughs> but how do we as Christian writers know when it's okay to do that and where is the line? For, for me, struggling with that issue, and again, because you know that I, I for, for my um, thesis, I, I wrote a memoir, mm -hmm. and there are memories in that when I am a little girl. And we also kind of referenced a car accident I was in. Mm -hmm. I had a head injury, so I have large memory banks erased from my, my head. Um, so some of my memories come from pictures. Some of my memories comes from, st come from stories that people have told mm -hmm. around me. Um, some of it is mine. So I'm kind of like this. I'm cobbling together some of my back, my own backstory. Okay. More than even normally. Because not everybody can remember what happened when they were four. But I have kind of some extra big holes. And I really struggled with that. How do I, with integrity, make sure that I'm, I'm using those techniques that draw people into the narrative and the dialogue is there, but I can't tell you what happened when I was four years old. Well, you three. used a really good word, integrity. Mm. Um, maintaining our integrity as writers to make sure that what we are writing, even if we can't remember the entire conversation, and we may use some extra emotion, that we're using it with integrity. Exactly. I mean, for me, it, it came down to kind of like a spirit check thing. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, I used that first, that first example of the writer who said, you just have to use, if it's true, you've got to stick as, as close to it as possible. So any phrase I knew, any, any fragment of, of actual words I knew happened, I used. I made sure to not deviate that. I didn't just pluck them apart and reconfigure them. A phrase, in, and there's some instances I know exactly what was said, because some parts are, there are mm -hmm. things that we have in childhood, you know, those little bits that just stick. Some things people have repeated to me over and over and over, so I, you know, have that mm -hmm. kind of family history um, kind of situation. But... When I went past that, when I went past my my written or recorded kind of you know factual, I've got the evidence, it's on tape as somebody having said this, then I had to really, really search my soul and say, right, am I just being a little gratuitous here? Am I trying to, you know, m manipulate the reader or mm -hmm. manipulate the situation? Or am I doing my very best to Knowing what, for, for me, because I'm not talking about my childhood, 
my mom didn't change her cadence of her speech or or whatever when she you know at 40 she wasn't a different speaker than she was at 20 that she was you know older so I already knew how my mom talked. Mm -hmm. I knew the way that she responded to things. I knew the way that she phrased things. So I took that knowledge and I was true to her personality. I was true to the situation and I did my best to, to be true to a conversation that would have happened. And then I would write it. And if I couldn't get as close to, without any manipulation, actually true stuff, I wouldn't write it. I'd find a way to, whatever I was trying to, to explore, I'd find another way. I only went to dialogue when I could feel reasonably certain mm -hmm. that I was getting the gist of the truth. And that's, I think, for, again, Christian writers, I think any writer, I mean, I would like to see just writers have integrity anyway. Right. Um, that would well, be, yes, why not? That would be nice. <laughs> but, but I think that if we're writing about something, especially when we, we're putting words into somebody else's mouth, and that's what happens in a dialogue, right? Whether it's you and another person or two people that you're witnessing, you're putting words in somebody else's mouth. And I think that that needs to be a sober thing. You have to really, really be careful when you do that and do it with integrity. Mm -hmm. All good stuff. Um, well, we've come to the end of our time. You have been listening to The Art of Semi-Fiction, where we explore every corner of the written word. I'm Jane Daly. And I am Robin Miller. And thank you for listening. Please subscribe to our podcast and we will see you next time. Thanks. Mm -hmm.